these are some of the, the so-called ponds, uh, Kaling's Pond. This is from a helicopter, so it, it actually is large. Uh, that's one of the ones that's on the Millennium Line. And as people know, I mean, these, these ponds are, are fairly toxic. Fish can't usually survive more than about four days. Um, workers do die if they fall into them. Um, it's happened a few times, and of course, <coughs> water problems. Sink through left and killed about 1,600 birds uh, a year or two ago. But it's it's a place that isn't just about the manufacturing, it's about the pipelines, it's about the connections. Um, and this is one of the concerns about uh, moving to an economy that accounts for its cause, is that once we lay the pipeline, once we have the logistics networks, once we have the factories playing our iPhones elsewhere, it's a little hard to unravel all that. So, you know, uh, while there's while there's much 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 good happening as far as people trying to localize, grow chickens in their backyard, um, and, and and basically promote local commerce, which is uh, you know crucial, um, the other side of the economy is not is not working with a level playing field. Is that the economies of scale that, that go into something like oil sands and pipelines are there to, to kind of skew the balance because they've already locked in their their their, their sort of business plan, so to speak. And are able to develop, uh, de de deliver the sort of product fairly, fairly cheap and fairly fast. This is Alan Adam. He's the chief of one of the tribes of the Fort Chip, which is down down the river north of the West Sands. And this is the community of, uh, that many of you have probably heard of that are experiencing elevated rates of cancer. And he's pointing to a map, basically laying out how all around the community, uh, which is on the, the shores of Lake Athabasca, which is just an incredible watershed, uh, are, going, are going to be surrounded, or are already surrounded by, by leases for uranium, um, uh, maybe some natural gas, and definitely unconventional fruit. Um, so the scale of the project, I mean, it's already the size of, of you know, bigger than Britain. Um, it's going to keep getting bigger. And, and, I, and I guess I know this because as Canadians, this is, this is a major contradiction moving towards Copenhagen. At a time when we need to be pricing carbon, um, this is this is a free for all that's happening in our, in our backyard, and I mean Alan's just a, he's a great guy, but they're they're, so they're a little under resourced, <laughs> which is why their their campaign to slow things down hasn't been uh, as successful. I mean, they're going up against some of the biggest companies in the world. On the ground, it's the city of steel, as one might expect. Okay, just this last part here. This is this is the this is the first power center known to the world. Um, this is a big box mall near uh, at Colma, California, and it was developed in the 80s just as an experiment to kind of mix up stores. And, and for, for those of you who, who don't shop, uh, and I'm presuming everyone shops here to some degree, is the big box mall is, is kind of a series of large warehouse style stores with parking lots all around, kind of like a moat. And, and it's been sort of a killer application of, of, of the modern discount economy, the modern retail uh, store. Because it, it just it's able to move a lot of product fairly cheaply, um, so they came up on this by mistake. They just they just wanted to go get away from old-fashioned closed walls, and they built this thing that became a, a huge phenomenon. And it looks completely nondescript because this is the template for our, our world in North America for the most part. This looks, this is absolutely nothing special. You'll see no ephemera plaque saying the world's first big box mall. It's not you know you can't get tours or anything like that. Um, and, and like Las Vegas, I think, I think it really um, you know, is indicative of, of, of the world we live in. Right next to it is, is a huge complex of cemeteries. It, it actually has more dead people there than a lot of people. Its, it's original in, industry was, was interning human remains. And it, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a place that, that is kind of a, a mix of, well, as they like to say in Coleman, they come here and chop to you, That's not what's the most important. Come on, The Home Depot is actually built on a huge landfill, a pile of garbage. So that rectangular building is the Home Depot, and that mound is 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 part of the, the, the garbage that it's built upon, like generations and generations of San Francisco garbage. So I mean, having a 24-hour Home Depot built on a mountain of garbage with literally hundreds of thousands of dead people surrounding, I, I just couldn't I just couldn't not go to that place because I just had to make that pilgrimage and try to figure it out a little bit. And, and you know, it, it, 
you know, it turned out, as I said, being a pretty nondescript kind of place. Nothing special, just business as usual. One of the things, one of the things I mentioned previously is that consumerism isn't hasn't been working for consumers very well, even prior to the recession. Some some essential costs have been going up, even though we've been sort of drowning in cheap stuff. And so my work on homelessness was really was really focused on new aspects of homelessness. So this is this is a, a guy named Witt, and I'm sure that's not his real name. And uh, this is in suburban Surrey. So incidents of homelessness in the suburbs in Canada and certainly in the United States um, has has you know has skyrocketed. Um, is is the, the homeless in uh, so-called residential communities is is a huge huge issue. And I'm sure I mean I'm sure they're just stress is had in Vancouver about, about having, you know, the sort of armies of homelessness, homeless people that they have coming into the Olympics. But I wanted to just kind of underline that connection to it, because the downward mobility that a lot of, house, a lot of households are experiencing isn't, is tied to the, the bargain experience in, in two ways, is that, again, we're dependent on some of these deals in, in ways that we haven't been in previous generations. Um, and second is that, well, some of the economic hollowing out has a lot to do with the loss of uh, valuable jobs, of higher wage jobs, um, of that shuffling around of the production of, of, of things. So this is a, a, some ice uh, a friend of mine took in Antarctica. This is a, a hunter that I spent some time with in Resolute, uh, Hans. He's actually from Greenland, so that's why he's called Hans. Um, and maybe I'll end it with this, because, you know, the real cost of things, the depth of globalization, I mean, these are kind of slogans in a sense. I mean, I, I, you know, it's easy to kind of give lip service and complain about Walmart and, and to, sort of, uh, uh, to sort of disparage consumerism. What I was interested in, 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 if I could, if I could accomplish that, in how all of this connects us, because I, I, I do deeply believe that it does. Even up in Resolute, um, you know, uh, price is a huge issue. If their if their prices go up, a lot of them go sort of without proper housing, and that is very much a huge issue in, in none of them. Um, but at the same same token, I mean, they're on the cusp of change because they've been living with high prices for a long time, and that's been a lot of trouble for them. That's that's I think hampered uh, the ability of hunters to actually go out and hunt. I interviewed homeless hunters in Calgary who couldn't you know raise money for gas for their uh, for their snowmobiles. And so high prices have some, you know, have some real consequence. If we go to a, a more carbon, uh, carbon uh, uh, realistic, a more carbon priced economy, um, that has some, that has some uh, potential to cause some, some, uh, some additional dispossession. So in the Arctic, you have hunters that have trouble paying for snowmobile gas uh, and to try to do their livelihood as hunters. But at the same token. Uh, the effects of climate change are, are making it hard for, for many elders to navigate on the ice in the traditional way that they have. Uh, ice is changing a lot more than it was. So, I mean, if you, you go to you go to anywhere, you go to anywhere, you go to Coleman, you go to Las Vegas, you go to the Arctic, and you can see kind of signs of how these things are piecing together because you know uh, they are just as here. They want to be able to uh, get things that are affordable to sort of make their way in the world to. To, to be doing what it is that they want to be doing, but yet they're sort of constrained by some of these new things, some of these former externalities like climate change and pollution. So when I talk about the real cost of things, it's it's really a, a, a call to the fact that that you know our main our main issue isn't so much that we aren't wealthy. I mean, you know, we found billions to put into stimulus and and and, uh, and buy out spending for the recession and. You know, it, it isn't really a crisis of ingenuity because I mean we have many of the many of the technologies, most of the technologies that could get us into a more efficient, sustainable world. Basically, my, my view is that it's it is a crisis of view. It's a crisis of how we see things. It's a crisis of, of, of expectations, um, and it is a crisis of democracy because ultimately many of the decisions that are made on our behalf, whether it's say it's climate change issues in Copenhagen or uh, you know, energy efficiency standards or resource development. Um, these are ultimately deeply questions of democracy. And so um, maybe I'll just leave it at that, and maybe we can get into discussion. But I'll probably go on to that. Thank you.